Greetings students and welcome back to my series on complex variables. In this lesson I'm going to talk about a pretty famous concept in complex variables known as Jordan's Lemma. I used to believe that it was pronounced Jordan but it's actually a French name so it's pronounced Jordan. Anyway, let's start by drawing what we need to properly state Jordan's Lemma. We have our complex plane with the real axis and the imaginary axis. We've also got a smaller circle with a radius r0 that's centered at the origin and we've got a larger semicircle with radius r that's also centered at the origin where capital R is greater than capital R0. I'm going to label this semicircle as C sub capital R. So now that we have everything we're ready to state Jordan's lemma. Suppose we had a function f of z that was analytic or holomorphic so differentiable everywhere in the upper half plane that was outside the circle given by the magnitude of z equals capital R0, so outside the smaller circle in the upper half plane. Suppose also that as we just mentioned, C sub R is a semicircle of radius capital R, whose equation is given by z equals capital R times the exponential of i theta, where theta lies between 0 and pi and capital R is greater than capital R0. Finally, we'll suppose that for all points on the semicircle CR, the function f of z had an upper limit of m sub capital R that approached zero as the radius of the semicircle approached infinity. If all of these statements apply, then Jordan's lemma says that the contour integral of f of z times the exponential of i a z over the semicircle in the anti-clockwise direction approaches zero as capital R approaches infinity. Note that a here is a positive constant. Now for this video we're going to go ahead and prove this lemma. The proof starts out a bit more awkwardly because it doesn't seem very related to Jordan's lemma but it will come together at the end. We're going to start by graphing two functions on the Cartesian plane. y equals sine theta and y equals 2 theta over pi. 2 theta over pi is just a straight line going through the origin that becomes 1 at theta equals pi by 2. Just like how sine theta becomes 1 at theta equals pi by 2. Now you can see from this graph that sine theta is actually greater than or equal to 2 theta over pi for theta between 0 and pi by 2. This is actually important because it means that the negative exponential of capital R times sine theta is less than or equal to the negative exponential of capital R times 2 theta over pi, where capital R is obviously a positive constant, which it is because it's the radius of a semicircle. And since the exponential of negative capital R sine theta is less than the exponential of negative 2 capital R times theta over pi, that means the integrals of these quantities from 0 to pi by 2 also follow the same inequality order. Now you can actually compute this latter integral and when you do that you'll get pi over 2 times r times 1 minus the exponential of negative r, where r is greater than 0. And since r is greater than 0, you can safely say that this quantity is also less than pi over 2r because the exponential of a negative number is a positive number that's less than 1. And if you take 1 minus of that and multiply by pi over 2r, you end up with something that is, in fact, less than pi over 2r. So therefore, the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the exponential of negative capital R times sine theta is less than or equal to pi over 2R, where R is greater than zero. Let's go back and look at the graph of sine theta. We can see that sine theta is symmetric when you reflect it about theta equals pi over two. So what we can say is that the integral from zero to pi of the exponential of negative capital R times sine theta is twice the integral from zero to pi by two. Therefore, the integral from 0 to pi would then be less than or equal to pi divided by 1 capital R, using the same inequality that we wrote above. Now, this inequality actually has a name. It's called Jordan's inequality, and Jordan's inequality is what we will use to prove Jordan's lemma. So let's continue the proof of Jordan's lemma. We'll start by taking the integral from the limit that we want to ultimately prove, which is the integral over CR of f of z times the exponential of i times a times z, where CR is a semicircle on the upper half of the complex plane with radius capital R. And since we're integrating f of z over a semicircular arc, what we can do is convert this contour integral into an integral over an interval by using the polar representation of complex numbers. 
And since the radius of the semicircle is a constant, we can write the complex variable z as capital R times the exponential of i theta, and then replace all the z's in this contour integral by capital R times e to the i theta. And if we do that replacement, we'll get this integral on the right. The only remaining step is to replace the dz by d theta and adjust the limits on the integral accordingly. Now from the equation for z above, we know that dz by d theta is just i times capital R times the exponential of i theta. This means that dz is just i r times the exponential of i theta d theta. So we can replace the dz in the integral to get the following. And since we're integrating over theta now, we just have to change the region of integration from the contour CR to the interval from 0 to pi. Let's now take the magnitude of this entire integral. If you recall a theorem that I proved way back in my ML inequality video, links in the description, you will remember that the magnitude of the integral is less than or equal to the integral of the magnitude. This theorem applies to a complex function that's piecewise continuous over the interval where we're integrating. And if you go back up to the assumptions we made before proving this theorem, we can see that f of z is analytic everywhere outside the smaller circle of radius r0. Therefore, this integral magnitude theorem can be safely applied to our situation. Let's recall another fact from complex analysis. If I have two numbers, two complex numbers, z1 and z2, then the magnitude of the product of z1 and z2 equals the product of their magnitudes. I can then apply this exact same logic to the expression inside the integral to split up all the magnitudes. For this last magnitude, we can further split it up to get the magnitude of i, which is just 1, the magnitude of the positive real constant capital R, which is just capital R, and the magnitude of e to the i theta, which is also 1. Now, if you don't believe me on the last one, you can apply the Euler formula to the exponential of i theta. You'll get cosine theta plus i sine theta, and the magnitude of that is just the square root of cosine squared plus sine squared, which is just 1. Now, what about the exponential term? How do we deal with this? Let's take it aside and make some more room. Now, the exponential of i theta inside the exponential can be expanded to cosine and sine using the Euler formula. We can now split up the exponential because there's a plus in the middle. i is the imaginary number, so i squared is negative 1, which means that this second exponential becomes the exponential of negative a r times sine theta. Again, the magnitude of the product of two complex numbers is the product of their magnitude, so we can now split up these two terms. Now, the exponential of negative a r sine theta is a real number, and the magnitude of a simple real number is just that real number, which means we can erase the magnitude bars from it. That just leaves us with the first term, which is the magnitude of a pure imaginary exponential, which is just 1. Again, if you end up using Euler's formula because you don't believe me, you'll get a cosine term plus i times a sine term, and the magnitude of that will just be 1. Therefore, we can effectively eliminate this first term because its magnitude is 1, and when we do that, our final answer is that the exponential of i a times r times the exponential of i theta is just the exponential of negative a r sine theta. So now we can go back, cross off this exponential magnitude, and perform the replacement on the integral that we were previously working on. Now what about this first magnitude, the magnitude of f? Well, it's actually pretty easy. We know from the assumptions of our proof, if we scroll all the way up, that m sub capital R is the upper limit of f of r times the exponential of i theta, which is the same as f of z because we just applied the polar representation of complex numbers. So what we can do is that we can say that the function f is less than or equal to m sub r. But we can't substitute this directly into the integral because it's an inequality. However, what we can say is that because the function f is less than or equal to m sub r, an integral involving the function f multiplied by a couple of positive numbers will therefore be less than or equal to the integral of its upper limit, m sub r, multiplied by those same positive numbers. Again, m sub r and r are just constants, so we can take them outside this integral. So now you have m sub capital R and capital R multiplying the integral of this exponential. 
Now comes the fun part, because at this point, we can apply Jordan's inequality. The integral of the exponential that we have very strongly resembles the integral in Jordan's inequality. The only difference is the extra a factor. But that doesn't really matter because you can easily treat a and capital R together so that if you apply Jordan's inequality, this integral becomes less than or equal to the following. Now the capital R's will cancel and the expression just becomes m sub r times pi over a. We're almost done. Throughout this proof, you'll recall that we've used a fairly long chain of equalities and inequalities. And if you go back up to the start of the chain, you'll have the integral over the contour c sub r of f of z times the exponential of i a z. What we're going to do is we're going to copy paste this term from the beginning of our chain down below. From all the computations and simplifications that we've done in this proof, which have either involved the equality or the less than or equal to sign, we can therefore see that from the transitive property of inequality, the magnitude of the integral over the contour CR of f of z times the exponential of i a z is less than or equal to mr times pi over a. Now I'm going to label this inequality as 1. So now that we have this final inequality, we're almost done with the proof. If we go back up to the original assumptions we made in the statement of the theorem, we can see that the limit of the upper bound mr as capital R approaches infinity is zero. Therefore, if we take the limit of inequality one as r approaches infinity, we'll find that the limit as r approaches infinity of the integral over cr of f of z times the exponential of i a z is less than or equal to zero. And since the magnitude of a complex number is never negative, we can get rid of the less than zero bit and change this to the equality because obviously having the limit of this magnitude be negative wouldn't make any sense. Zero is the only possibility. It shouldn't be difficult to extend this equality further and say that since the limit of the magnitude of the contour integral equals zero, the limit of the contour integral itself must be zero. This is because as the magnitude of the complex number approaches zero, the complex number itself approaches zero and gets closer to the origin. So finally, after all of this work, we've proven Jordan's lemma. In the next video on complex variables, I'm going to show you how to apply Jordan's lemma to calculate some improper integrals via the residue theorem. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan signing out.